let's start talking about the system design. Every time a designer of a new RO system starts with the question, uh, before going with the new RO system, what information uh, do I need to start working on a new design? And there are several items that need to, uh, to be taken in consideration in this case. First, it's the uh, quality of the feed water. There are many criteria that source water needs to meet in order to be used for reverse osmosis. The next important parameters are the required design productivity and product quality. Finally, there are certain boundaries or limitations that the new system is subject to. Uh, this can be energy consumption or the size of the system or the uh, feed temperature, sometimes the type of pretreatment, etc., etc. Once uh, all the necessary information is collected, the designer starts working on the optimal design by using projection software. The resulting design should provide the solution for the optimal configuration. For example, single versus double pass, number of pressure vessels, number of elements per pressure vessels, selection of the particular member mode model, its quantity, process parameters, feed pressure, etc., etc., energy consumption, and if necessary, required chemicals dosage. The basic unit of any RO system is a single pressure vessel. The pressure vessel combines several membrane elements, typically six to eight, or maybe fewer for some brackish water applications systems. The feed water is introduced to the front membrane elements and the permit uh, and the concentrate flows are collected at the back end, typically. Uh, in actual RO systems, the flow distribution in a vessel is uneven. The first membrane element usually produces about 25% and sometimes even more of the total vessel permit flow, while the last elements yield only around 5%, 3%, 4 5 8% of the total permit. The decline of the permit production along the vessel is mainly due to the uh, increase in the feed salinity, and it is associated uh, with osmotic pressure as the permit is removed from the vessel. As you can see uh, on the uh, table below, this is the example of how Q plus software calculates the distribution of uh, various parameters along the pressure vessel for each individual element. Several pressure vessels can be arranged in groups, sometimes in tens or even hundreds, to form a so-called row array or a row train. In a row architecture, there are two basic configurations that can be combined to achieve uh, various design targets. The first one is called the stage. This is the group of pressure vessels arranged in parallel with the common feed, permit, and concentrate headers. The other configuration is called a pass. Pass can combine either individual pressure vessels or stages with the common permit header. The configuration shown in this slide is a simplest single pass, sync one stage train. The number of parallel pressure vessels depends on the product capacity of the system and some other considerations. The recovery of such an arrangement is typically around 50%, less for seawater, maybe around 40, 45%, and sometimes more for brackish water. To increase system recovery, two and more stages may be used. Concentrate from vessels of the first stage can be combined to become the feed flow to the vessels of the next stage. By doing this, one can increase recovery. Uh, for brackish system, it may be up to 75, 80% with two stages and 85 and sometimes even more uh, with a three stage system. For seawater applications, you can achieve the recovery of 55, 65% with two stages. With one stage, it is below 50%, around 45%. 
Typically, the number of pressure vessels in two consecutive stages is close to two to one, and this can be easily shown by this consideration that uh, the flow through individual uh, pressure vessel needs to be uh, even from stage to stage. Let's say uh, consider that each stage has a recovery of 50% and rejection of 98%. And we have the incoming flow of 20 cubic meters per hour. It will require two pressure vessels in the first stage. At 50% recovery, the permit and concentrate flows will be split after the first stage into 10 and 10. The reject is then sent to the second stage. And since the flow is only 10 cubic meters per hour right now, in the second stage, only one pressure vessel is needed. So you see the ratio is two to one. Permit from the second stage would be five cubic meters per hour, and adding that to 10 cubic meters per hour from the first stage makes the overall production of the system 15 cubic meters per hour, or 75% recovery. The higher recovery reduces the amount of wastewater generated by increasing the uh, by, by generating more in each stage, but it also reduces the quality of the permit. Look, in this example, for example, uh, let's see that the feed uh, salinity is 100 ppm. And the permit concentration after the first stage is 2 ppm with 98% rejection and 4 ppm after the second stage, making the total product TDS of about 2.67 ppm. There is always a trade-off between high recovery and high product quality for every reverse osmosis system. To further purify the permit, multi-pass systems can be used. The permit from the first pass is then sent to another arrow uh, array that is known as the second pass. A two-pass design in seawater application may achieve a very good product quality that typically not be achievable, not achievable with the single pass design. The two-pass design also provides a useful tool to adjust pH in the second pass. For example, you can uh, dose caustic to uh, either achieve the high rejection of boron on the second pass, which is problematic in the first pass due to the potential scaling, or, for example, remove carbon dioxide before the mixed bed after the RO. Recovery of the second pass can be as high as 90% with only two stages. This high recovery can be achieved because of the relatively low concentration of dissolved solids in the feed of the second pass. However, the overall recovery of a two-pass system is always lower than that of a single-pass system. Again, this is a trade-off between the generated reject and product quality. Brine or reject <clears throat> can be partially or fully recirculated into a feed stream. This can be done in two ways, either recycling the reject after the first pass or after the second pass. When we recycle it after the first pass, the reject salinity is higher than the raw water, and overall salinity increases. This results in lower overall product quality, larger feed pump requirements, and higher energy consumption. Then you would ask me why we do these things if we uh, you know, lower the, uh, the product quality. This is usually done uh, for smaller systems that are prone to fouling. And the recirculation increases the cross flow velocity and reduces individual modular recovery, and therefore reducing the risk of fouling. On the contrary, the reject from the second pass is relatively clean. It has a better quality than the influent to the first pass. And that's why it's virtually always recycled to the front of the first pass. This minimizes the waste from the system and also improves feed water quality, as the feed to the first pass is diluted with the relatively high quality second pass reject. Sometimes the so-called permit split is used in seawater desalination systems, 
uh, to achieve a better management of the product. Let's recall that the permit quality is progressively getting worse from lead to tail element in the pressure vessel. In order to take advantage of the better permit quality in the front of the pressure vessel, permit is collected from both sides of the pressure vessel. Low TDS front permit is then sent directly to the final product line, while a high TDS back permit is treated with the second pass. Physically, this can be done by either using a, a blind interconnector in, in some way that separates uh, 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 two consecutive uh, elements or by throttling valves on both permit lines to control the flow. The last but not the least is the in this section is a hybrid design. The hybrid configuration is the combination of two different membrane models within the same pressure vessel. The lower flow membranes are placed in the front of the vessel, while the higher flow elements in the tail. The graph on the bottom shows the flux distribution along the pressure vessel for conventional and hybrid designs. Recall the lead element experience, recall that the lead element experiences the highest flux and has the highest risk of defouling. Hybrid design eliminates this disproportion and allows for better flow and recovery balance within the vessel. Besides that, if the hybrid design does not compromise the product quality, the feed pressure and therefore energy consumption is lower for the hybrid system. 